All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Erica Fay and I'm here with Jonathan. And um, we're so happy to see you all here on our um, masterclass today. Jonathan, do you want to say hello? And, uh, you know, Dan, we got Bridget. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. We are um, very excited about this master class and um, happy that you guys were able to uh, join us. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, my name, like I said, is Erica Fay, and I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and a life mastery consultant. And I've worked uh, with athletes for the better part of about 20 years. Um, helping them to move through transition and improve their life in four different arenas. So I'll talk about that in a little bit, but um, specifically around identity and relationships. Um, and so Jonathan, maybe you want to just tell them a little bit about you and then we can dive in. Yep. Sounds good. Yep. So um, again, I'm Jonathan Orr. I am the founder and executive director of athlete transition services and um, our whole organization uh, is really we, we exist to help athletes prepare for and to manage the transition into life after athletics. And so um, we provide workshops, uh, we provide life coaching, and, um, and it was also birthed out of my, my personal experience as a former um, college and professional athlete. And I'll talk about that a little more as we go on. Cool. Cool. So yeah, we wanted to start off by defining what we mean by athlete transition. And Jonathan has a really cool take on this. And um, so I would wanted to uh, allow time for that and so that we can all be on the same page with regard to what athlete transition specifically means. So Jonathan, do you wanna tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, sure. So uh, as you guys are aware, um, transitions, not only with athletes, but in life in general, um, it comes in a lot of different uh, capacities. And so, um, but for the sake of our discussion today, we are referring to the point <clears throat> in an athlete's career um, when they are no longer an athlete, right? So if this is a college uh, athlete, this is, you know, after graduation or after eligibility, um, when, when they aren't, you know, competing in that capacity anymore. Um, or for a pro athlete, this is after retirement, um, you know, high school athlete after they graduate, so on and so forth. So that's the period that we're talking about today um, as far as athlete transition. And um, a, a, a great place to start, uh, if we could dive into to this slide real quick, is to understand the process of transition, right? And so it starts with understanding the difference between change and transition. So um, if you're anything like me, like a lot of athletes, um, like a lot of folks in general, right? A lot of time you, you, you use those words interchangeably, right? Change and transition. But um, to understand the transition process, we have to understand the difference between these two. So change is what happens to you. Um, whereas transition on the other hand is what happens inside of you, right? Um, if you look at this, this little chart right here. So change results from uh, the differences in, in external situations. So for an athlete, this is after you're done playing, right? So um, this is external. You no longer have to go to practice anymore. You no longer have to get up at 6 a.m., whatever the case may be. Um, these are all external things that are, that are happening to you um, that, that, that happen immediately, right? But on the other hand, the transition is the psychological uh, progression that, that you go through as a result of that change. And so um, whereas change can happen fast, transition, on the other hand, takes time because it, it is a process. And so, uh, and so we wanted to make sure that we um, explain that, that the, the difference between those two. Um, and this is, uh, I love this quote uh, by William Bridges, who is one of the transition gurus. Um, he says, change happens to people. Transition, on the other hand, is internal. It's what happens inside of people's minds when they're presented with the change. And so that really leads us into the next part. We're gonna look at the three-phase process of transition. Um, and so again, this is, this is uh, adapted from William Bridges' transition model. And so um, you have the ending, you have the neutral zone and the new beginning. So when you're thinking about an athlete, um, the first, the, 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 the thing that initiates that transition process is the ending, right? The fact that they have to say goodbye to their sport. A lot of time it's something they've been doing for 15, 20, 30 years, you know, so on and so forth. And so 
Um, they have to say goodbye. This is where they also have to uh, learn to let go. And it can be by choice or, or force. So regardless of if it's an athlete's deci decision to move on, or if it's not their decision, if it's forced, it can still, they still have to um, deal with that process. And so, uh, and so I think that's, that's, that's important to understand. So whether it's choice by, the, by their choice or they're forced, um, they still have to deal with that, that, that internal process of no longer being an athlete. And it can be difficult either way. And then you get to the neutral zone. <clears throat> this is where the, 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 you know, you're done with your sport. Um, you, you haven't really found this, this new way in life. And so you're, you're kind of stuck in this in-between place. It can be uncomfortable, right? Um, because again, this is something you're not used to. It can be unfamiliar, obviously, because uh, 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 we'll talk about this a little bit more um, soon, but, but you know, they're used to a certain schedule. They're used to um, their life being a certain way. And now all of a sudden, all these things have changed. And so it's unfamiliar to them. Um, it's ambiguous, uh, you know, not knowing what's, you know, what, what, what's next, what's to come. And then oftentimes, and, I, and I'm sure, uh, you know, you folks who work with um, athletes have experienced a temptation to retreat, to try to hold on to something that isn't there anymore. And as a result, um, those athletes who don't navigate through this neutral zone properly, um, they, they, can, they can get stuck um, and sometimes for years because they haven't uh, figured out how to get to that new beginning. But when you get to the new beginning, when you can successfully navigate through that neutral zone, um, and we'll share tips on how to do that and strategies for that, um, you know, in the upcoming minutes. But uh, then you get to the new beginning. This is where you embrace the change, right? The, the, the change of, 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 of no longer being an athlete. Um, you, you learn to embrace it. You find a level of comfort in this new way of life. And then hope, hope in knowing that even though this part of my life that I love, that was great. It meant so much to me. Even though it's over, I understand and I'm hopeful that there's more to life. There's more to uh, expect. There's more to look forward to. And that, in fact, the best days are still ahead. Yeah, and I love that um, description of uh, change versus transition. Um, because I think that's a really important distinction. Uh, I think it's easy for most of us to just lump everything into a category of change, but really yeah. in understanding that transition is an internal process and that as we are increase our awareness of the internal process and as we look at all of the components that can go into successful transition, um, that gives us a jumping off point in working with our athletes and um, even for the athlete themselves and kind of preparing themselves for um, what's what lies ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. So perhaps, Jonathan, you know, because I know you've been through this process and yeah. um, perhaps you might share a little bit with us about your story um, of change and transition and kind of how you were able to navigate that. Yep. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, I, I played college football at the University of Wisconsin. And ever since I was eight years old, I had dreams and aspirations on, on playing in the NFL like my uh, hero, Jerry Rice, who had, you know, almost a 20 year career. And I just knew that was going to be my story. Um, and so uh, I made it to the NFL. And after a couple years, I was done. Um, it, it was over. And, and dealing with the, the, the shock of for one, my plans not working out the way I anticipated that they would. That was rough. But then I, I didn't realize that I had issues until I was done playing that I had. And, and most of them stemmed from um, a lack of identity outside of football. So once it was done, it was like I, I, I didn't know who I was anymore. Uh, it was, it, I was like, I cease, you know, to, 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 to exist, to matter. And then the other thing was um, not having not, – not, understanding and realizing that I had a purpose outside of outside of my sport um, for so long I put so much time energy effort my life revolved pretty much revolved around this 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 one aspect of of, 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 of my identity and and I thought my, my purpose was wrapped up in it so once I was done it was hard to figure out um, even though I had graduated right I graduated uh, uh, you know from the University of Wisconsin and I knew that day would come someday, but I, I just wasn't prepared when it was, when, when it did come. And as a result, I struggled trying to figure out what's next and who I was. Yeah, and I think that, you know, what we've seen is that um, that's a very common uh, 
experience yeah. for many athletes. This is what I've heard in my work with athletes. And I know that, you know, you're addressing that with your workshops and your coaching as well. And so really, um, you know, getting ahead of this and really taking a look at how we can um, help athletes navigate this time. You know, when we're talking about this, um, Jonathan and I have kind of identified three common challenges that we've seen that athletes face. So um, one of the main ones that you touched on, Jonathan, was identity um, and really struggle to kind of define yourself and who you are and, and what your purpose is. Um, outside of sport. And we've, you know, this is something that we've been able to see, you know, with other clients as well, but specific to athletes because they've been so focused on a goal in their sport for the better part of their lives. Um, it can be really um, easy to kind of have that be your sole definition of who you are, what you're here to do and be um, and so that can be a period of disillusionment, um, you know, once that comes to an end, or if, like you were saying, like if there's a significant change all of a sudden that um, you maybe weren't anticipating or planning for. I know that you had said that you were planning to be in the NFL for a lot longer. Yeah. Um, and so that was kind of difficult to kind of back up and say, all right, well, wait, now what? Um, and really kind of having that sense of identity as a challenge and kind of having to explore what that meant for you. Um, and so we're gonna get into how you can kind of prepare for a moment, but the two other challenges that we've identified that we've seen in our work with clients and uh, as athletes ourselves as well is, um, I, is the uh, structure piece, you know, for the better part of life, you're kind of told where you need to be, what you need to do. Um, you know, you've had a whole system of support around you. Uh, maybe when you're younger, it's, you know, parents driving you places, you've got coaches. Um, then once you hit the collegiate athletic uh, level, you've got, you know, trainers, uh, coaching staff, you've got all kinds of resources, academic support, um, things of that nature. And then, you know, moving into professional sports, similar, tons of uh, resources at your fingertips for you. And then when that comes to an end, um, many times there's the, the structure of support just kind of evaporates um, yeah. at a very basic level too, in that you don't need to be at practice at a certain time. You don't need to, you know, show up and do X, Y, and Z. Um, so the structure is, is, is just no longer there. Um, and then finally with um, the other challenge that we've noticed is kind of that, that lack of purpose, or I like to kind of use the term vision um, and really, you know, having to recalibrate, like what is, what is it that I'm going to be directing my focus on from here on out and what can feel really good to me. Um, and I think these are questions that sometimes aren't even asked until yeah. the change is kind of occurring um, or the transition, you know, the change is, is happened and you're as, and the athlete is kind of trying to figure out what to do now. Um, so I was talking with Jonathan and, you know, we've been able to share some of our, um, client stories and things of that nature. And, uh, one of the, the things that kind of stands out in my mind specifically is one of my, um, clients was talking with me about, uh, being a baseball player and how he had been a baseball player for the better part of his life. And then gets out of, um, playing baseball in mid twenties, uh, I think was how old. And as he was describing this to me, he was telling me that he was trying to look to enter the workforce and was describing that he had no transferable, transferable skills, which, you know, as an outsider, I'm able to look at him and say, oh my gosh, you have tons of transferable skills. But, you know, it was just a really, um, it's an important, like, I think example, because this is not uncommon for athletes to feel this way. And it's actually not true. Um, so that's just an example of how, um, you know, having that kind of lack of vision, um, not really being certain about your identity after sport, and then that, that disappearance of the structure 
how that can really um, be really difficult to move through. Yeah. Yeah. Th th those are all great points, Erica. Um, and I, I, I mentioned this the other day, but um, since 2014, uh, we've been collecting data. We have an ongoing survey. <clears throat> we've interviewed um, hundreds of athletes from all different sports, uh, male, female, um, college and former college and professional athletes. And so uh, one of the questions that we asked on this survey is, uh, you know, once you were done playing, what were the m most challenging aspects of your transition? And the, the top three, um, all the time, consistently, it, it comes down to identity, that lack of vision that you talked about, Erica, and then structure, even in our workshop uh, that we provide, our next season workshop at, uh, for, for college athletes around the country, and um, we engage in dialogue and have discussion, but it, it constantly comes up when we ask them, what do you anticipate being your, uh, you, you know, um, a, a big challenge for you as you transition? And, and these are the things that constantly come up. And so, um, so yeah, that, that identity piece is, is, is so crucial. And I, I really think that it's the, uh, it, it's, it's the foundation for many of the struggles that athletes have once they're done playing, because you know, if, if you don't understand who you are outside of um, football, basketball, swimming, whatever the case may be, then it, it's going to be hard to understand that, that, that you can do other things in life, right? That, that, uh, that you'll be good at other things, that you have skills that can be transferred into other areas if you don't first believe that, that you're more than just whatever sport it is that, 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 you, uh, that you've been participating in. And so, and so, um, so yeah, those, those are very good points, Erica. And I, you know, I, I totally agree with you. These are definitely the things that, that, um, that we're constantly seeing uh, athletes struggle with as it relates to their transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And so, um, you know, with that, we have some ways that we think have been really useful in addressing those three common challenges. Um, and, you know, Jonathan, just to kind of get curious with you too, like, what was something that really helped you on the identity level? Um, and then maybe we can share our experiences with, you know, um, navigating transition and kind of how to prepare the athlete. Yep. So it, it was a, a couple things. One, understanding the, the root cause for, for the issues I was having. Um, and then once I did some soul searching, it took me about about 18 months before um, I, I finally felt like I was in a good place after I was done playing. And so part of it was soul searching, realizing that um, I had subconsciously, didn't even realize it, but uh, adapted this and, and believed this lie that, that I, I, I am what I do, right? Because for so long, I have been receiving so much um, since I was a kid, right? You know, you know how it is. You, uh, you know, you, you see a young athlete, they're good. All of a sudden, 10 years old, they're starting to get this attention. Um, and, and so that, that was a story. And then you go into high school, it's more of that. Then you go to college and now you're, you know, you're on TV and, 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 and ESPN and all this stuff. And so I started to believe like, like, like this is all that I do. I mean, that, that I am, you know, the, the thing that I do. And so um, once I started doing soul, search, soul searching and, and, and a lot of prayer and, <laughs> and uh, just had a great support system, I came to realize, like, like, no, I'm not what I do. You know, it doesn't matter what my title is, if I'm playing football or not. First and foremost, I'm, I'm a human being. And, and that alone gives me all the innate uh, just, just self-respect, self-worth, self-value that I need. And so whether I'm catching a football or not, that doesn't matter because my, you know, my identity isn't wrapped up in what I do. And so uh, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so so I, I would say that was the biggest thing. Totally. I stopped believing yeah. that lie. Yep. Well, you said a couple of key things too, which, you know, we kind of highlighted earlier, but, you know, you, you mentioned the identity piece and really um, how that was a struggle and trying to kind of redefine how you, how you knew yourself to be. And then also you mentioned having a, a structure of support, which is huge, right? Um, mm -hmm. Having people that you can kind of go to that aren't just, um, that know you to be more than just a football player or more than your sport. Um, and so that's really, really a, a important component, I think, yeah. you know, as you mentioned. Um, so when we're talking about preparing the athlete, um, you know, in advance of any change 
Uh, maybe we can just kind of jump in here and, and, and talk a little bit about some of the things that we've both seen have been really, really useful in preparing athletes and um, helping them to navigate change. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think one, um, let, let, let me say this first, if you don't, if you don't mind, Erica, I, yeah. my hat goes off to, uh, especially on the college level, the amount of support and resources that are um, available for athletes nowadays. Uh, when, I, when I came out of college, you know, <laughs> gosh, 12 years ago now, it, it was primarily academic support. But now to see um, the student athlete development, the life skills professionals that 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 are uh, that are that are there for athletes, helping them to develop um, as a total person. Uh, I, I think it's I think it's tremendous. So um, and and so I, I would say that's a that's a big part of it. Uh, just if if you if you're in a role like that, right, or not even specifically in a role like that, but if you have any contact with athletes, whether you're a coach, you know, um, even an academic specialist, whatever the case may be, provide opportunity. It's important to provide opportunities for athletes to, 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 uh, <clears throat> to develop, right? To understand that now, you know, why they're currently playing like that, they have more to offer. There's more to them than just uh, their sport. And so um, I, I create opportunities for them, encourage um, discussions, right? Uh, to, to, to these, these are discussions that, that, that need to take place. And even before college now, like as soon as possible um, with, with all, with the way youth athletics are nowadays and, and it's being year round and, and, uh, and just all of just, just the attention and, and everything going on, just starting at a young age. And <laughs> excuse me now, I, I think the earlier we can have these discussions and help athletes to realize that, um, that they are more, they were created for more than just their sport. I, I think, I think that's a big start. Yeah. And I love that. Um you know, starting early and, you know, you mentioned the way that youth sports are now. Um, it is really easy to get swept up in. We're going over here or over there for this mm -hmm. or that game. And, um, you know, even kind of from what I've seen, it's been um, encouraged that yeah, at a pretty young age, you're honing in on like one or two sports. Um, that is not how it was when I grew up. Um, and so, you know, yeah. I'm sure there are, there are benefits to that for sure. Um, but it's also, you know, I think really important to, to be able to continue to um, talk with the child and as they develop about, you know, who they really are. Um, and I know that you and I, Jonathan, share a belief that there is a purpose for us that is larger. Um, and there's something, there's a power breathing us. Um, and really, really when we hone in on like getting in contact with that and kind of beginning to unpack and understand like who we really are and who we're meant to be and become and what we're meant to do. Um, but knowing that our value is not completely tied up in what it is that we do um, yeah. and really, you know, one of the things that I like to take my clients through when I'm working with them, um, when we're seeing an impending change coming, or even when they're in the transition process, um, because usually that's when they'll get in contact with me. I don't get as many um, preparation visits as I would love to have. Um, but you know, oftentimes we'll have to take a look at that. Like, okay, well, what defines you? How do you see yourself? Like, um, you know, what does it mean when you're asked, like, who are you and what are you here to do? And so one of the things that I think has been really, really useful in terms of my work with my athletes and my clients is that we get really, really clear on core values. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and there are so many core values um, or values in general, and then kind of honing in on what really is important to you or what sticks out to you, I think is a really great jumping off point for that identity discussion because you kind of have a baseline, um, you know, what is important to you? What are some things that, you know, you can't really envision yourself living without? So, you know, I've gone through this process myself. So for me, it's integrity you know, doing what I say, saying what I do, delivering what I promise, you know, my word um, is 
you know, what I mean and really backing that up with action, um, you know, and, and, you know, kind of taking a look at all of the different core values. So it could be family, it could be, um, you know, respect, it could be, um, you know, faith. Uh, what, there's a whole process that I take my clients through and to hone in on really what the core values are and kind of um, help people to get clear. Because some people are super clear about it. When you ask like, oh, what are your core values? They can rattle them off. Um, but generally speaking, there's about five to 10 that I've seen that people usually have as like standard operating procedures for their lives, right? Um, and without really having that as a baseline, I think it's easy to jump into the disillusionment and try and like have a hard time kind of figuring out you know, who you are, what your purpose is, um, because, you know, being an athlete, I'm sure is part of your purpose if you're an athlete. And mm -hmm. there's something more that, you know, you're supposed to pull from that as you evolve and as you continue to grow. Um, so would you want to add anything, Jonathan, with respect to that? Yes. Um, as athletes are preparing for the transition, right, I think it's also important um, to start tapping into your other gifts, your other talents, the other things you're passionate about. Uh, if, if, if you wait until you're done playing, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I think Kobe Bryant said it best. If, if, if you wait until you're done playing, then a lot of time it's, it's, it's difficult, right? It's, it, I think he said it's too late. I don't necessarily think it's too late, but the sooner you can start, um, realizing the, the other things you're good at, right? The, the, other, uh, the, the other things you're passionate about, the other things that give you life, um, then the, the better off you'll be. Because then you can start uh, exploring those areas now. You don't have to wait until, you know, you're done playing. So for athlete professionals, people who provide services for athletes, I think that's something else um, that, that, that can be done sooner. Um, providing opportunities for athletes to, to start doing self, um, just exploration right figuring out what other things um <clears throat> you know what are the gifts you have what other talents do you have what are some other areas you want to explore and then start doing that that uh that sooner so that's that, that's definitely another thing i would add <laughs> excuse me um uh for for athletes to th that could help them prepare for the transition in advance yeah and i love that um you know as you're talking about really looking at the other skills that you have, the other passions that you have. Um, I think that sometimes that can be a challenge too, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when you're in athlete uh, support services and really helping, you know, working with the athlete as, as the total person, as the whole person on a full spectrum level, um, you know, there's a couple of things that, that I've seen that have been really uh, instrumental in helping people kind of come up with what else am I passionate about? What else um, am I really good at? And that is to take a look at, you know, what it is about your sport that you love, you know, what it is about, you know, maybe what your role is on your team, um, what your role is currently, like as if you are an athlete, um, what is it about that that actually really gives you energy that you really enjoy? And then take a look at some of the, um, the longing for something else. And if there's any discontent, any like frustration with the current set of, set of circumstances, um, you know, I always say that your longings and your discontents are um, two growth signals, the way that, that, that the universe kind of speaks to you in terms of, you know, here's, here's some like direction for you, for your path. Um, if you're noticing there's discontent in a certain circumstance, or there's a longing for something else. Um, you know, those are kind of uh, big categories. And when you have someone to kind of sit down, you know, with you as an athlete or, um, you know, kind of with you as, as like planning next steps, really asking those questions, like what are the things that you're longing for? What are you noticing that you're discontent with? Um, and I, you know, that goes back to that structure of support. Sometimes, you know, having those people asking those questions is really, really powerful. Uh, absolutely. And you just made me think of something uh, else, Erica. One, one of the other things that um, athletes really appreciate 
uh, that, that we have an opportunity to, 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 to do with them in our next season workshop um, is go through a series of assessments, right? And so, um, because uh, uh, athletes have a lot going on, especially, yeah. especially on the high school, college, pro level, a lot going on. So the more intentional we can be about um, getting things in front of them and resources in front of them, um, then, then the, the better off we are. And so some of those assessments include transferable skills assessments. So helping them realize now that <clears throat> they are more than qualified to, to do a lot of things in life, um, other, you know, outside of their sport. And a lot of it is because of the, the, the skills and the strengths that they've developed as a result of being an athlete. So, and then, um, as you mentioned earlier, it values assessments, uh, um, uh, that we, we do uh, another assessment um, called Heart Head Hustle, where you, you start tapping into those other passions that you have, and as well as the things that you're good at. And so, um, so I, you, that that's another piece of advice that, that that I would definitely give. Yeah, I think all the assessments are really important too, and and really, you know, sometimes that's what somebody needs to kind of see something yeah. in black and white. Yeah. Um, you know, like oh, well, look, I, I'm good at this. I didn't realize that, or um, you know, something of that nature. Um, and then having conversations about it though. So like, what does that look like in mm. the real world or how can that be applied to something you can do next? Or how do you incorporate, you know, your skills into something that you really would feel passionate about? Um, because, you know, as you and I have both discussed, and, and we're both we're both doing this work because this is something that does light us up, that's near mm -hmm. and dear to our hearts. And um, you know, you know, I honestly believe that that all of us have that. No one is put here to just work until the weekends and then yeah. you know wait and then work until the weekend again. Um, that even if you have been participating in sport or an athlete for the better part of your life that there's like you said a next season and really figuring out like what can make you come alive going forward um and help you to feel as meaningful as you possibly can great point great point erica great point cool so maybe now we can touch on uh, maybe some tips that we have that mm -hmm. um you know, we can share in working with athletes or if you are an athlete yourself um, to kind of move through transition um, and change. Yeah, so um, one of the, the biggest tips that I, that I have is to, uh, is to set goals. Um, this is something that, that, you know, if you are an athlete, you've been doing, you know, <laughs> your, your whole athletic career since you were a child um, and, it, it's something you're familiar with already. So it, it's, it, it shouldn't stop, right? Uh, the same way uh, once the season is over, you set off-season goals for strength and conditioning or, or you know, before the season start, you, you set personal goals for yourself or team goals. Um, you should do the same thing in, 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 in your personal life. Uh, set career goals, set, um, you know, <clears throat> personal family goals, uh, educational goals. Um, set them because what it does it provides the, the, the especially we, we, when we talk about not having as much structure uh, as you once had, but, but now it, it provides you a level of focus, right? Um, something to hold yourself accountable to. Um, and, 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 and so that, that's definitely one of the biggest ones, just uh, setting goals, um, action steps to, to help you, um, you know, achieve and reach those goals. Um, that's, that's, that's one of the, the, the biggest things I would say. Yeah, and I agree. Um, and we've talked about this before. You, you know, you and I have had conversations about this, but the idea of having, you know, like short term goals in mm -hmm. addition to the long term <laughs> goals and the short term goals, having them be okay for them to be baby steps. Because I think if you're used to like a big, hairy, audacious goal, like, oh, you know, I'm going to win the championship this year with my team, or I'm going to, you know, get the whatever MVP award, whatever it is, that's like a really large goal that, you know, what does it take in the interim to get you there? So the same with life, like, okay, so maybe, you know, 
a goal would be, you know, I'm going to make three phone calls or I'm going to go, um, you know, look at what's out there in terms of um, resources, you know, and, and having that be a short term goal, maybe for a, a day or a week or whatever, and then really celebrating that like, hey, I did it you know, celebrating your successes um, along the way with the short-term goals, because the short-term goals are ultimately what gonna, are what gonna lead, what's going to lead you to um, success in the long-term goals. So um, what I've seen is that oftentimes those shorter-term goals are easy to overlook. And <clears throat> I've had people even tell me like, well, I'm supposed to throw a parade because I made a phone call. Well, no, but you're supposed to give yourself credit for taking the step that you could from where you are with what you have right now. Um, and I think that that is uh, a, strat a thinking strategy that can be really, really useful when, um, you know, when you're an athlete or when you're working with athletes who are, you know, trying to kind of figure out what's next, right? I, I love that. And it's, it's not as frustrating, right? And it's not as overwhelming. Um, is it, you know, if, if you're done playing and then you're thinking, hey, I got to get this ideal job, right? Um, you, you know, sometimes that can be overwhelming, especially when you don't, you're not necessarily reaching, getting those results right away. But if you can, I love that, set smaller goals that can help um, lead you, right, to eventually get to that place. Uh, that, that's, that's awesome. Good mm -hmm. point. Good point, Erica. Well, and even, you know, you, you made me think of this also, the, um, the four key components of life. I always like to work with people from this framework because I think it helps to really shape up like defining goals or setting short-term and long-term goals is taking a look at four key components. So your health, okay? So what do you want for your health going forward? Um, you know, what types of activities do you want to be able to engage in? How do you want to move your body? How do you want to feel in your body? Um, you know, a lot of times after a significant time in sport, you've been pretty banged up and you might need to like do some stuff to recoup. Um, so really having health goals, that's really, really important. Um, you know, without your, a healthy functioning body, it, it makes it really difficult to live a full spectrum life. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also, uh, like relationships, um, you know, taking a look at what do your family relationships look like? Um, maybe you want to cultivate a more love relationship um, or really connect with friends or, you know, what's the status of your relationship quadrant and how, do, how fulfilling does that feel for you right now? And then the third component that I look at is time and money freedom, because I think that that is, those things are kind of interchangeable, right? Um, you know, we always, we always, hear a lot about, um, oh, well, there's not enough time or there's not enough money or whatever the case might be. But really, though, you know, time is one of our most valuable resources mm -hmm. because we can't get that back. And so really kind of taking a look at what would feel fulfilling to you to focus your attention on as far as time is concerned. And, you know, what would that look like? What would you be doing? And, and that kind of thing. So that being a third quadrant. And then finally, the career or vocation or creative exp expression. Um, and so the, that's kind of the what's next chapter for that component, uh, right? So maybe that's, you know, adding some giving back or um, figuring out a cause that's near and dear to your heart. Um, and that kind of gives some sort of a framework and direction for that quadrant of your life, right? Awesome. I love those four quadrants. And then uh, one other tip I have is to, to talk to people, right? Um, you, you don't have to go through it on your own. There are a lot of, you have a lot of resources at your disposal, especially if you're a college athlete. Um, there, there, there have been people in your life for the last four or five years who are truly, in most cases, who are truly um, vested in you as a person. And so, um, you know, reach out to somebody, let them know what it is you're experiencing. Reach out to your teammates that are, you know, that, that are now done playing. Um, ones that have uh, finished before you, right? Um, to to kind of see how they nav navigate it through um, this transition. And, and uh, it just, it makes no sense to, to, to go through something like this on your own. So um, use your resources, reach out, uh, talk to people, let people know what's going on, family members, professional help. Erica, Faye is great. 
Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's another tip. Definitely reach out to somebody. Let somebody know what's going on with you. Well, right. And I think what you're saying too, you know, in terms of like, when, if we go back to preparation and really preparing, you know, the person for change and transition throughout life, really starting to create a culture of having it be okay to let people know what's going on with you. And yeah. that doesn't mean you're just constantly blabbing about yourself or you're letting everybody know you're an open book, but like trusted others, um, really starting to like allow, have it be okay. Like, you know, talk to your teammates, talk to your coach, talk to, you know, your family members, um, people who do have your best interest in mind. Um, and really will support you in, in, you know, even if it's just listening, um, but really like that culture of having it be okay to start discussing like what's happening or, hey, I, you know, your fears. Um, that's a really difficult thing for a lot of people to talk about, whether you're an athlete or not, you know, addressing your fears um, is a vulnerable thing. So um, like you said, you know, when you're, you're talking about accessing support, um, you know, I think that that can be much easier in a change and transition phase if you've had that culture of, you know, permission up until then, you know? Absolutely. 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 So, so I think that leads us to, did you have any more tips, Erica? Um, you know, I think that the other thing that I just wanted to add is like, <clears throat> You know, this was something that I had to navigate personally um, and professionally, but like letting it be okay that you don't have everything figured out right now, um, you know, because I think if you're used to being on the top of your game, literally, um, kind of having to backpedal and be like, I don't know what's coming next and I don't really know yeah. um, what I want or what I'm good at or, you know, whatever it is, but like that, that's a really vulnerable place for a lot of people to be. And so um, I just kind of wanted to throw that out there because I think, you know, as much as we can cultivate that um, support and having it be okay that someone doesn't have it all figured out, doesn't have all the answers um, and, you know, hey, you're engaged in the process, good for you. You know, like you're talking about it, awesome. Like now you're in the process of figuring it out and this might just look like what it looks like when it's all coming together, right? Yeah, yeah. I, a, a great piece of advice or, or a, I guess a saying that, that someone told me when I was going through something similar, because you know, as an athlete, you, you, you're, again, you, you know what you're going after, right? You know what the end goal is and so, um, and it's, it's rough when, once you're not and you don't have that as part of your life anymore, you know, trying to figure out <laughs> what to do and what you're doing and, and, and you're working towards it. But something someone told me that just stuck with me, uh, the saying was, it's OK to build and not know what you're building. Right. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you know what you're working towards, you might not know exactly how it's all going to come together. But as long as you're um, you, you, you're building right, you're 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 embracing a process. No one, and I, you know, when it, when it's all said and done, it, it, it's, it's going to be good. And so, uh, but I, I love that. Thank you so much for bringing that up, Eric. Sure. And I love what you just said, too. And it just reminded me, too, of something that I always work with my clients on. Because a lot of times, Jonathan, and I think you've seen this, too, getting caught up on the how can actually stop you in your tracks, right? Yeah. Like yeah. You just yep. take one action step yeah. with what you have from where you are and then kind of trust that the next action step will be revealed. Yeah. That's so important because you don't have to have it all figured out. If I wanted to drive from Chicago to California, I can't tell you every turn that I'm going to take, but I know when I get to wherever I need to be to take a turn, my GPS is going to tell me take a turn. And like yeah, yeah. we all have, you know, an internal GPS too, that um, we're going to kind of talk a little bit. I'm going to talk about a little bit when we get into the, like defining a successful transition, but really, you know, that's like being in it. Like I am going to create something that is going to feel fulfilling to me. And, you know, there's a whole process that I'm going to go through to help figure that out. And what I know right now is that I can do this, whether that's make a phone call or, you know, reach out to a friend or whatever it is. But like you said, um, just moving forward. And then you start to create that, like 
momentum of movement, right? The hardest thing is actually getting the ball rolling, but then once it's in motion, keeping it in motion is a lot easier. Mm. Well said, well said, Eric. Yeah, so right. right now we're going to move into um, defining a successful transition. So what does it look like? Uh, so we talked about the common challenges. We, we, we have an understanding of what um, athlete transition is in general, um, preparing athletes, talk about tips. So all of this is working towards, towards what, hopefully. And so that's what we're going to talk a little bit about now. Um, you want to go first, Erica? You want me to go? Sure, I can go. Um, I think that, you know, when we've talked about what successful transition looks like in terms of our work with athletes, you know, Jonathan and me, um, I think one of the main things to kind of go to is that there's no perfect, right? Like um, being okay, successful transition is continuing to move forward in the face of not really knowing how all of the pieces are going to come together, which is kind of what I was saying a little bit earlier, but you know, there's no perfect and that you've never really arrived. You know, um, there have been so many times in my life where I've set a goal and I'm like, yeah, once this happens, then I'm going to be on the mountaintop. Right. But like, it just, it's not like that the growing and changing and, and, and evolving is the most human and the most natural thing in the world. And so having it be okay to continue to involve, evolve, not involve, but, um, and involve other people, I suppose. But, uh, my mentor always says that our, um, the curriculum of our life is the content of our evolution. And I love that because, you know, if something hadn't have happened, or if, you know, you remove something from the puzzle of your life up until now, you might go in a very different direction. Um, and so really having it be okay uh, to not have it all figured out and know that there's no perfection and that sometimes the transition process, because it's happening internally, as Jonathan described for us earlier in the class, is um, since it's an internal process, it can sometimes kind of feel like you're not exactly going in one straight path and that has to be okay. So giving yourself permission to have that be okay is a really important component of a successful mm. transition, I think. That's good. That's real good, Erica. Um, a, a successful transition to, uh, to me, one, one way to describe it is one in which um, you're, you, you're, you're at an intersection or you, you're at least advancing towards an intersection in which um, you are incorporating, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm speaking particularly about uh, as it relates to careers, right? And, 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 and different job opportunities and things like that. And so um, one in which your, your values, right? Your, your, your career values, your personal values are, 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 are uh, incorporated um, your skills, right? Your transferable skills, your, um, your, your passion, right? Something you're, you're doing something you're passionate about, something that, that g gives you life, um, something that you're good at. Uh, and so when, when you can um, sort of arrive at that intersection or, 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 or be on a road to that intersection, um, that's a successful transition to me. Um, and, and it goes back and even before you get 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 there, I think it, it really all starts with, like we said earlier, just that identity, having your identity intact, um, you know, as, as, a, as a person, right? Just just not as a, not, you know, over reliance on, on that athletic identity, but but just understanding who you are um, outside of your sport and, and having that intact and then being able to get to a place where you're incorporating your skills, you're incorporating your your values, your passion, um, you know, the things you're good at. Um, that's, that's a successful transition. Uh, yeah. To yep. Well, and I love that, the intersection <laughs> idea. And just, you know, you and I have talked about this too, having an ability to have an openness to a new chapter. You know, you talked about that in the beginning of our class when you were looking at the definition of transitions and kind of that tendency for all of us. If we thought something was great, we have a tendency to kind of hold on and want it to stay the same, right? But really 
working to have an openness of, you know, something, something great is, is down the pike for me. I, I know it. And having like a belief and an openness and an understanding that that could be possible and that, you know, I know it's possible um, as a professional, but I also, you know, you know, when an athlete can really kind of incorporate that, like I know that the next chapter is going to be, you know, just as fulfilling, if not more fulfilling, having openness to another chapter, I think is really important too. Awesome. Good deal. Good deal. Uh, and then, you know, I mentioned earlier um, that cultivating that um, kind of ability to listen to your internal GPS, um, you know, all of us have a mental faculty called intuition. And for some of us, it's more cultivated than others. Um, a lot of times, you know, it's been labeled different things, call it a gut instinct. Um, Gandhi calls it the voice for truth. Um, and he also says that it, you know, the voice for truth is as loud as our willingness to listen. So really starting to cultivate an ability to really check in with yourself and ask like, what feels right to me? You know, in what direction um, does it feel like I, it's in alignment with who I know myself to be? And this is where we, we talked about, you, you mentioned Jonathan again, identity and really going back to your core values, but really um, cultivating that ability to listen to your internal guidance because it's there um, and it's funny too, what I've seen is that a lot of times when people start to hear from it, and I've done this myself too, is we'll start to argue with it. Like, no, I don't want to do that, <laughs> you know, but you know, if, yeah. if things actually kind of unfold a lot more gracefully, if we are able to kind of listen to our internal guidance and that internal voice, um, and that doesn't mean that you're not going to have any feelings or a process of, um, emotions around anything that maybe you're feeling like you're leaving behind. That's all really important to acknowledge and accept mm -hmm. and um, appreciate as you continue to kind of check in, like what feels like I'm moving in the right direction for me now. Awesome. Very good point, Erica. Very good. Cool. So is there anything else you wanted to say, Jonathan, about successful transition? Uh, no, I, I think that was that was it. That's all I all I have for a successful transition. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and the other thing that I just thought of this when I was asking you um, was just you know we had mentioned this earlier in the class, but really accessing a structure of support and having that be okay to help you navigate, you know, going forward. Um, nothing great can ever really be created in a vacuum and by yourself, right? Like, so whether that be having a family there to like, you know, you go home and you recharge um, or, you know, having somebody that you can talk to about, you know, your goals, your next steps, um, you know, just having it be like cultivating a new, a new chapter, I guess, is a great way to hmm. kind of put it a new chapter of a structure of support moving forward. So that could be a mentor, it could be a coach, it could be, you know, your family, it could be, a, you know, a spouse, um, anything like that to continue to support you in being who you know, that, you know, who you were meant to be and who you're meant to become. Mm. Mm. Well said, very important. Awesome. Thanks. So uh, that brings us to the um, conclusion of the content of our master class. Um, thank you guys so much for participating. Uh, we have a few uh, special offers um, for you guys. Want to talk a little bit about about that, Erica? Yeah, for sure. And I know that we we had originally um, wanted to invite questions from you guys too. So. If you're able to, because we were having some tactic difficulties earlier before we uh, 
all hopped on the call. If you're able to, see if you can type in, um, if there's a place that you guys can find to do that, it should be on the right hand bottom side, um, to kind of type in any questions if you have any and we'll uh, address those if, um, if we get them or if you see that there's a way to kind of raise your hand under the participant um, um, toggle bar at the bottom, uh, we would love to answer any questions. And if that doesn't happen, we'll just, this is the little, you know, technical announcement, then please feel free to email us and yeah. we're happy to get to your questions via email. Um, you know what, Erica? So mm -hmm. uh, above, um, it has microphones under their names. Can you see that? Are they able to yeah. speak if unmuted? They are. We would just, um, they would just need to raise their hands. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So if they can uh, see a place to do that, that would be great too, because then we can call on them. Got you, got you. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So in the meantime, as, <laughs> as we're all navigating that, and we appreciate you hanging in there with us um, as we are uh, doing this with, I would say for me, without a ton of tech savviness um, at this point, you know, we do have a special offer for you guys for being on the call. And um, I have uh, strategy sessions carved out of my schedule. Oh, we do have a question. Cool. So we see a question. I'm going to call on you one moment. Um, I have some strategy sessions carved out of my schedule uh, for this coming week. And a strategy session is a 45 minute phone conversation where we get crystal clear on where you are now, what you would love to create and the next most important step to get you there. And I'm gonna offer those complimentary um, for those of you that are on the call today. So if you're interested in the complimentary strategy session, please send me an email and um, I will be happy to work with you to get that set up. That's awesome. And, and Erica, just to clarify, that's not just for athletes, right? That's for, that's for everybody. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yep. So uh, what the special offer that I have, um, I recently uh, wrote a book called Games Over Life's Not the Athlete's Guide for Transitioning. Um, it's about two months old. Um, and so uh, for the next month, um, I'm going to offer uh, that book um, free of shipping. Um, and so you just pay the, the, the cost of the book. Um, we'll get it shipped to you uh, regardless of where you are in the United States, not in the world, only the United States and some parts of Canada. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, but, to, but to get to that, it's uh, gamesoverlifesnot.com. Gamesoverlifesnot.com. And so, um, and then you just enter the, uh, the promotional code, um, uh, master class. So enter master class uh, in the promotional code section, and then you will have um, free shipping. And I have another offer if there are any student athlete uh, development professionals um, and you are interested um, in any of our workshops, I'm going to offer a 20% discount um, on, on uh, all workshops. Just reach out. Um, you can visit our website, <laughs> excuse me, www.atscorp.com. Dot org. That's www.atscorp.org. Um, there's a contact page on there. Uh, and, and so just reach out and, and let me know you participated in this and we'll get you squared away um, with, with one of our workshops. Awesome, Jonathan. That's so cool. Um, so yeah, so we'll stay on for a few more minutes uh, to address any questions. I know there's one here. If you have one, please do raise your hand. Um, but Vivian, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you now. So please ask your question. Um, thank you so much, Erica and Jonathan, for making the time to um, to do this this um, conference and workshop, this masterclass. Uh, Jonathan, you mentioned earlier some things about uh, colleges and how they're offering more programs to help student athletes understand what they are going to be dealing with, what transitions not only just into their sport, but even when they leave their sport. But how aware, um, I kind of like a two part question, how aware do you feel parents are in that process? And what can we do, do you feel um, like in, as professionals helping with these transitions 
how do you feel, um, what do you feel is most important so that we can communicate the importance of understanding this to kit to the parents of these student athletes and how early can we start? I mean, does it start at 10? Can it start at, you know, does it start 16? How young do they have to go? Man, I, I, I honestly believe, and so l l let me say this. So we, uh, so our organization, we're in a process now. We piloted a youth program, so some youth programming in the Metro Detroit area last year. And so now we're looking at expanding it. We got some more partners involved and we want to create a, a we're going to, we, we don't want to, we're going to create a national um, uh, student athlete um, youth program. Uh, for, for student athlete development for middle and high school students. So <clears throat> I would really say as early as, 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 as middle school, we need to start uh, having these discussions. I don't think parents are, are as aware as they should be. Um, <laughs> excuse me, my son, he plays uh, uh, flag football. He, he's four, he just turned five years old. And so this is a pre-K league and we just finished up the season yesterday and to see the, the amount of pressure, right? The amount of, of uh, attention, um, just just that goes into to a pre-K flag football, uh, you know, league. It's 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 incredible. And so as I'm as I'm at the games and participating and and helping out with coaching and things, it's in the back of my mind. Like, man, these kids, and oh, and don't let a kid have a great game, right? If they have a great game, they're they're a superstar. You, you think they're in the NFL already? And so. Um, <laughs> And so, but what it's doing is it's, it, it's, it's feeding into that false sense of identity um, at an early age. And so if we don't start combating that with, with, with the truth, right, with more information um, for parents and, and ultimately for, for children, then this, is, this cycle is just going to continue. So I think um, I got a little long-winded there, but to answer your question, I don't think parents are as aware as, as, as uh, they need to be. I think um, more programming, and I think we also need to start um, just having more discussions with our children at a very young age, helping them to realize like this is only part of who you are. Um, there's going to be more to your, there is more to your life and there's going to be more to your life, you know, uh, you know, once you're done playing. So we need to start developing those aspects of your, uh, personality and life as well. Yeah. And just to kind of piggyback <clears throat> on what you had mentioned, Jonathan, you know, this is an awareness process, right? So the more aware that the parents can get around um, all of these components of the full spectrum living or, you know, developing the total person in the athlete, you know, the parents are super instrumental in that. And so, um, you know, beginning those discussions, like Jonathan was saying, at an early age, so that, you know, this is something that people are talking about and other parents are talking to other parents about. And, you know, it's not just about who performed best in the sport. Um, but I think that, you know, having that awareness, like this is an awareness practice and we're getting this on our radar more and more. Yeah. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. So it looks like there are no more questions and I know that we're over time a couple minutes here. So um, if there's no other questions, we will wrap up for um, today and it, from, my perspective, it was really great to see uh, so many of you guys on the call and I appreciate everybody taking the time out to really join us and to listen and to um, be attentive and, and, and please do submit your questions to us if you think of something afterwards. We're happy to answer any questions following the call. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I just want to say one other thing, Erica, thank you so much for coordinating this. Uh, Eric and I, we, we, we connected a couple months ago and we wanted to figure out a way uh, we, could, we could do some things together. And, and uh, so this was her idea to, to put on this master class. And so, um, and like Erica said, thank you all for participating. Um, you know, we hope you got something out of it. For sure. Thank you, Jonathan. It's been fun collaborating with you and I'm sure there'll be more, more collaboration to come. It will, it will. Yeah. All right, well, thanks everybody for being here and we will uh, look forward to hearing your questions if you have any um, after the class. All right, thanks. Thank you. Bye.